Um, my name is Mike Aldew. I'll introduce myself again for those who've just joined. Uh, I look after the Beam Exchange, which is the, the platform for information and knowledge sharing about market systems development. Today's Grab the Mic webinar will be about uh, the program called Elan RDC, uh, RDC in, uh, in DRC, in, or RDC, depending on your nationality, uh, in, the, in the Democratic Republic, the Congo. Um, and we have three really interesting speakers who are going to talk about this quite unique program, really, that ran for several years uh, in, uh, in DRC. And so we're going to have speaking today, Grégoire Poisson, who was team leader, uh, for the last phase of uh, Elan. Uh, his colleague, Edwige Takasi, who is the uh, sector lead for their access to finance uh, uh, work, and Ralph Saidi, who led their uh, renewable energy work. So it's a great pleasure to have them here. Just before I hand over and sort of begin, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, this, this uh, Zoom platform. We will be, the speakers here will be talking for about half an hour. Um, um, and then there'll be space for questions and answers. So I invite you to post your questions at any time during the webinar into the Q&A box um, feature, which you'll find at the, probably at the bottom of your screen. Don't put them in the chat if you don't mind. Put them in the Q&A because that is easier for us to manage and then we can line things up in a great way. Okay, so um, I'm gonna give, there's still people entering the room so I'm going to give it like one more minute, I think, and then I'll hand over to uh, Gregoire, who will be the first speaker, uh, and they can tell you about their work. Hi, Gregoire, it's good to see you there. Hey. All right, I think probably that's good. Let, let's let's start on time so we don't run out too late. Um, Gregoire, take it away, please. Tell us all about your, your program and the great things it did. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so yes, today uh, we wanted to tell you a little bit about what we learned uh, during the course of, uh, of Elan. Uh, so let, let me first introduce uh, Elan a little bit. Um, Raouf, can you? Step up to the first slide. Right. Um, so Elan uh, is, a, is an MSD program uh, that started in 2014, so a full seven years ago. And I'm emphasizing this because it's not so, so often that we have longer term uh, projects like this one. Uh, it's, a, it's a program that was financed by UK Aid to the tune of over 100 uh, million pound it's or rather it's it's part of a and it's part of a larger psd program uh, that also includes a, a twin sister project called sr that's uh, rather catering to uh, to the governance uh, the governance side of things um elon has been working so they, we we had from the beginning, quite uh, quite some freedom to choose sectors, uh, but at the end of the day, we've been focusing on mainly three: agriculture, energy, and finance. Although we've also dabbled in a, in a number of other uh, sectors, including cross-border trade, transport, uh, business development services, ICT, uh, etc. Uh, plus, we've been working in a number of. Uh, uh, cross-cutting themes such as marketing crisis, basically how to bridge uh, humanitarians and private sector actors, uh, and Jesse, uh, so basically how to improve the position of women within the sectors that we were working in. Um, when we started Elan in 2014, it was the, the first market system development program in the DRC. Um, and there was some hesitancy as to whether uh, the private sector development program could work in a country like the DRC. The DRC is one of the most difficult countries in the world to do business in. Uh, it's right at the bottom of the, the doing business indicator uh, index of the World Bank. Um, and it's difficult for many reasons, including the lack of infrastructures, 
uh, very few good roads, uh, very little access to uh, to electricity or running water, um, but also uh, lack of uh, good governance in general, um, a lot of corruption, etc. So n not the easiest place to to do uh, business in. Uh, next, oh. um, but. Um, Seven years later, these are the, the, main re, uh, the main results. So we've been working, uh, in, we, we've been developing a whole new renewable energy market, especially uh, solar, solar products. Uh, we've been developing the, the sales of uh, seeds and other agricultural, agricultural inputs directly to farmers. Um, we've done a lot of work on uh, mobile money agent networks. Um, we've been working on, on advocacy and, and uh, private sector advocacy to, to, the, to the government, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into uh, detail uh, of every intervention, uh, but we've been working, as you see here on, on the map, all over the country, and it's a big country, you know, the size of Western Europe, um, and mainly in the three main market hubs around capital Kinshasa, uh, in the mining belt in the south around Lubumbashi, and in the east uh, around Goma and Bukavu. Um, and so after seven years, we've reached almost a million people and increased the, their incomes by, by more than $50 million. Um, next, please, Rauf. So after all these years, uh, after working with more than 100 partners, uh, 200 interventions, uh, st staff of uh, around 100 people, uh, what, are the, what are the main lessons we've learned? So this is what we wanted to share today. Uh, we won't be able to go into the detail of our, uh, of our interventions. Uh, it's, not the, the, it's not the right place and, uh, and we don't have the time to do that. Uh, but if you want more, intervention, uh, more information, you're welcome to have a look at our, our website. Uh, but what, what we wanted to do uh, today was rather to work on, um, to share a few, um, a few very concrete lessons uh, that we thought were uh, as universal uh, as possible. Um, and we'll do that by first uh, discussing two case studies, one in energy and uh, one in finance, uh, and then trying to draw the conclusion from these studies um, and, and along four themes. One partnership, so how did we inter uh, interact with, uh, with our partners? Two timing, uh, when and how long uh, did, it we, did we work on a specific intervention or a bunch of interventions? Uh, then how we measured progress and finally um, how we engaged uh, financially. Uh, so for, four themes that we run through uh, through this presentation, and with that, uh, I leave the floor to Edwige for uh, the access to finance case study. Uh, how you can, yeah, next slide. Thanks very much, Gregoire. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Edwige Takasi. I'm a specialist in uh, financial inclusion, and I used to be the um, the lead for the access to finance sector at Elan. Um, and yes, the, the first case study we are going to look at um, will come from the access to finance uh, sector. And we are going to talk about interoperability. Maybe a word of definition uh, without getting too technical. Um, interoperability, uh, why it's important for financial inclusion, it's, uh, it, 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 it allows, it helps people um, whichever account, based on whichever account they would have, so whether it's a banking account or an account with a microfinance institution or maybe a mobile money account, it would help them use their account effectively as opposed to having to uh, 
uh, withdraw cash to make their payments and transactions. So with interoperability, uh, we have a situation where anyone having a mobile money uh, account, for example, from Orange Money, let's say, could uh, make payments or send money to somebody that would have a bank account or an account with M-Pesa. For example, um, and it, it, this topic was particularly particularly important in the context of the DRC because the country is pretty big. Um, Gregoire mentioned it; it's the size of Western Europe, um, with a very low level of infrastructure and very low level of uh, financial inclusion. So bank branches aren't. Uh, very widespread and therefore the hope for uh, boosting financial inclusion has been already for many years um, the ability of mobile money operators to open uh, accounts for millions and millions of people so this was done however we still see that um, these accounts aren't as useful as they should be because most people still have to withdraw money from their account to do any transaction this is the reason why interoperability was such a big topic for the DRC and for Elan, Elan specifically. Um, so with uh, COVID coming in, of course, I think everywhere in the world, the, the, the notion that uh, digital financial services could uh, be even more important um, in order to uh, get people to still have access to financial services, even in situations where they can't go to a bank branches, to a bank branch uh, made the topic even more important and therefore supporting interoperability was part of a long uh, COVID response later on. Now let's look at the four aspects that um, Gregoire mentioned. Um, first, partnerships. Partnerships, we, we had multiple partnerships around the topic interoperability, so I'm not going to zoom on to one specific partnership, but stress on the fact that one of the strengths that we had was to tackle the problem from various angles. So we had um, we started with a, a very wide market study involving several actors from the banking sector and also from mobile uh, money operator side. Um, we then had partnerships with several private actors, banks, microfinance institutions, individual um, mobile money operators, uh, the regulator as well later on. Um, and then we also uh, supported the, the creation and the development of a discussion platform, which we call the Digital Working Group, because we realized that um, sectors were working in silos, so banks working with banks and um, mobile money operators working on the on the you know side and aggregators fitting nowhere and nobody having any common platform to exchange ideas and talk about how to get inter interoperability uh, going. Um, so with those multiple partnerships, we were able to tackle uh, the problem from different angles, uh, starting by making it um, one of the key topics for discussion, because it was obviously on everyone's agenda, but also fostering uh, communication among actors. Um, with COVID, as I mentioned, we also had an aspect, an aspect where we decided to support aggregators, so much smaller actors that were in between, um, but that could provide a certain link uh, to the to the the ecosystem. I, I'll, I'm going to talk about it a, more, a bit more in detail in the next slide. In terms of timing, um, one of the strengths uh, we had was that we were able to have a succession of smaller and bigger interventions over a long time frame, starting from 2015 to 2021, with a mix of short-term interventions and also medium to long-term interventions. Just to give a, a, a few examples, um, we collaborated with Finca, a, a leading microfinance institution, and, and Vodakash, um, a mobile money operator, in developing, launching, and um, um, let's say marketing, um, the, let's say one of the very first versions of a digital savings and loans product on the market um, with the microfinance institution bringing its uh, knowledge in terms of credit risk and, um, and Vodakash bringing its wide network and wide um, number of uh, clients. There we, 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 we realized um, quite uh, quickly that 
there was a need, the market was ready, but this specific intervention was not as successful as we had we would have hoped. Uh, partly because um, there was a need for the partners to align a bit uh, stronger in terms of what their priorities were. Um, and I will speak about it later on. Also, on our part, I would say that um, result monitoring was not as um, it should have been, and therefore we realized a bit too late uh, what, what the main causes of the, the, the problems were. Second example would be the digital working group uh, where we organize sessions on key topics, including interoperability, but also um, other topics of interest for the ecosystem overall. And there, the idea was also to create a sense of ecosystem and not just actors that are functioning in silos. Uh, more interactions also meant that actors became aware that um, their, their competitors or their counterpart elsewhere were working on the same problems and they could, uh, they could build synergies among themselves. And finally, um, we supported aggregators, so fintechs, um, that um, created um, solutions uh, to bridge the gaps between operators. So typically, um, in the context of inter interoperability, those were actors that were building platforms in order to facilitate payments across, um, across sectors, um, payments, um, but also uh, having given the possibility to, to send and receive money um, and pay bills. So those are uh, exam key, key examples of, um, of interventions that Elan uh, worked, with, worked in, in terms of um, collaborations in DRC. I think we can go to the next slide. Um, and um, the other two elements that Greg mentioned was where the importance of result monitoring on one side and also the, the finance aspect. Those two are also very important for successful interventions because in the end, um, investing means that um, we want to see return and um, seeing return means that we, we need to be able to have key performance indicators and progress indicators. Um, for the Finca and Vodakash collaboration, we realized later on that uh, result monitoring failed in the sense that we failed to identify the, the, um, uh, the most pertinent, the, the most uh, relevant indicators um, that could uh, give us early signal, signals that we were going in the, in the wrong direction and we were not um, close enough to the market. And um, on the other side, the, the other example was our collaboration with the aggregators, the fintechs, and there it was the opposite. Because we had a very short time frame due to the pandemic situation, we, we had a very close monitoring uh, where we had meetings with them, sometimes even weekly, in order to track progress, identify challenges, and um, um, brainstorm together um, in terms of what to do to, um, to go beyond the challenges. Uh, the third example is the digital working group, where because of the setting itself, uh, we had a program ahead of time where we knew in advance when the next meeting was going to be, uh, what which topic we were going to tackle, and therefore it was easier uh, to collect information from the market um, and um, follow up on what um, what the, where the intervention was going. So again, um, part of the success is result monitoring. It's very critical and it was very critical. It made a big difference between the interventions where we saw early results and the ones where we failed. Finally, finance uh, was a key element. Um, I wouldn't say that um, the more we invested, the more we got results. It was not uh, so much about the amount. So we had a mix of smaller and bigger budgets. Uh, but we always or almost always had some form of co-financing. This was important because we needed to get our partners to have skin in the game. We're operating mostly with the, the, the private sector. Um, having interventions that are in alignment with their own strategy is important. And um, one signal that shows that this is uh, in line with their, their strategy is when they are prepared to put in, put it, put in some resources. So typically for um, the collaboration with fin Finca and Vodakash, we had a larger budget, but it was spread over uh, a, a, a time frame and over several work streams. 
And um, on the other hand, for, for the digital working group, it, this didn't require much um, financial resources, but it was a lot of work in terms of expert days. Um, and the lobbying side, the lobbying side was really important because it helped uh, bring the regulators to the discussion table and that had a, a major impact later on. And finally, for aggregators, smaller, more agile actors, uh, we didn't, um, our budget was not very big um, as compared to the overall budget of ELO, but it did make a difference for those smaller actors and our direct and indirect support mean that, meant that uh, they were able to go beyond what they would have done alone. Uh, so those four elements, um, I hope help better understand why we think um, why we think when it comes to um, interventions in a country as complex as, as DRC, um, those elements need to be looked at very closely. I'm going to hand over now to um, Rauf, who is going to talk about a more specific example in the renewable energy sector. Um, and then at, with this, I think we are going to have an overall picture of um, the work we have done in uh, DRC. Rauf, over to you. Thank you, Luis. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Rauf Saidi. I was the renewable energy sector lead in the first phase of Elan between 2016 and 2018, and senior advisor uh, towards the end of the program. And as we said, I'm going to be talking about a bit of a more specific case. Um, and that was our work in the renewable energy sector with a company called Altec. Um, so as you can see, um, Altec was a company that was founded by two individuals, Hoshikala and Yongwa. And the reason I'm kind of bringing this forward is that this was you know, a key uh, piece of how we interacted with this company. Uh, it was a very young company, um, driven with a lot of passion um, by these two individuals who, who, yeah, were almost a force of nature in the way that they got things done. And for us, that was both very positive, because on the one hand, we were talking directly to decision makers. Um, but on the other hand, it was also very obvious that they were the ones that were doing a lot of the work. So our role was really to also strengthen their vision um, and support them in, in, in the outcomes. Uh, while making sure that we're not putting more work uh, on their plate. So it's a totally different type of interaction uh, than we would have with uh, a large multinational. Um, to come back to um, maybe the renewable energy sector in general, a few words, at Elan and, and what we did, our main goal was to facilitate and increase um, access to energy for uh, poorer households. So when we were looking at a company like Eltec, we wanted to make sure that our strategy was well aligned with theirs. Um, and in this case, it was um, their vision and, and their passion um, was almost perfectly aligned uh, with Elan. Uh, so their product selection, uh, their business models, um, and then the way that they looked at the sector was, uh, yeah, again, very well aligned. So it really facilitated us to work with them on different uh, partnerships between 2015 and 2021, almost the length of the entire program. Um, but it also allowed us to just work as partners, even if there wasn't a project. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that later. So what we did is that we really worked together with them on their core business models and their core business actually. Uh, we never really had projects uh, next to their core business or new innovation. It was really meant to support their core business in growth. And it was only towards the end, uh, within the second phase of it all, that we started looking at new uh, innovation pieces, but all very small and all sort of in line with their next strategic uh, move. A large part of this, again, uh, was because we wanted to, at all costs, uh, avoid mission drift for Altec. Um, I think Gregoire explained some of the challenges of working in the DRC renewable energy sector. On top of that, brings you know very high capital demands. Um, it's a technology-oriented sector, all very challenging, especially if you consider the logistics. Also, in trying to reach uh, a broad um, group of consumers. So, to go a little bit more in depth on uh, some of these themes that that 
we are trying to assess these, these case studies along. I think maybe, first of all, really quick, um, what did Altec actually do? So Altec um, was really about yeah, gaining access to modern uh, energy methods, um, mainly solar, um, but they also started diverting towards cooking stoves at the end. Uh, there's a picture there uh, of somebody cooking on a uh, burn Jacacoa uh, cook stove using a solar uh, energy lamp, which was part of their solar home system. Um, and so we supported them on the rollouts of uh, their business using a whole suite of uh, technologies and products throughout the country. So they had three head offices, but they had a large, large amounts of uh, distribution hubs almost across the entire country. So if we look at the timing and how we work with Altec, uh, we worked on seven different specific projects or specific interventions. And again, these were not side project or singular project were always embedded within their business. It included uh, looking at new business models. Um, as an example, um, integrating pay as you go into their business, scaling, um, you know, reaching uh, very difficult to access markets in, in Equator or parts of the Kivus and digitization projects uh, jointly supporting them in a uh, CRM system, for example, to start managing and tracking consumers um, and their spending patterns. That's very connected to our results monitoring. So Altec was also a perfect uh, partner in terms of uh, results monitoring because we looked at digitization, because we looked at things like pay as you go where we could actually, not only we could track uh, what the effects were of, of um, different models and different strategies, but Altec as a company was also able to track both uh, goods sold across the country and the performance of uh, salesmen and as they would call them ambassadors. Um, on top of that, we also had sort of second degree uh, results uh, that really supported our strategy and the way that we looked at the sector. Um, and a good example of that was that Altec is one of the first companies to really start working on credit. Um, and they really debunked the myth that the DRC would be a poor country to work on credit. And we saw that they had, you know, between 95 and 98 percent uh, payback rates. This allowed both Altec to expand that model, but it also allowed us to um, advise other companies to uh, to follow in the same path. Finally, finance. Um, we really, as I said in the beginning, Altec. We started working with them almost from the first year of their existence. So we kind of grew together with them. The first project we did was uh, in the range of five thousand dollars. And three years later, we did a far larger product for $200,000, where we looked at scaling page go across the entire country. Um, we also acted uh, indirectly in terms of finance as an objective partner towards international investors and donors. And we continuously invested in this partnership um, because even when we didn't have projects running with them, Elan was always interacting with Altec and there was a level of trust there uh, that we were generally, you know, real partners um, and not um, a development program versus the company. So this was for us uh, a massive success. And, and um, yeah, I think also in terms of the program, um, a place where we learned a lot and also where we were able to really level with, uh, with partners on an equal sort of playing field. So let me give the word again to Gregoire, who sort of expand from the specific uh, case study and talk more about the program in general. Thanks, Raouf. Yes, so uh, what have we learned uh, in terms of these four different dimensions we were uh, mentioning right now? Uh, first one, partnerships. So in terms of partnerships, uh, Raouf, can you uh, go to the next slide? Actually, the second next. Um, so we, par partnership is uh, is essential uh, for an MSD program. Uh, it's all about choosing the right partner because MSD is uh, uh, about facilitation. We are we are not um, delivering the program ourselves. So actually finding 
the, the right partner to develop our intervention is key. Uh, and to, the, to choose the right partner, we need two things. Uh, we need a partner that's aligned, uh, that has the strategy that actually fits with, our, with the vision of the firm. Um, and we also need a, par a partner that is able to execute. Uh, so a strong partner uh, that can make things happen. Um, and I think uh, here, the, the, the examples were, were I think, uh, like two examples here in the, uh, in, in the case studies. The one of Vodacom, I mean, Vodacom had all the capacity in the world uh, all the financing uh, needed, but uh, unfortunately, they were they, they were not aligned. They want they they wanted to own the product. Uh, we had facilitated uh, a, um, a collaboration with a bank in order to develop micro loans, um, but this is not what they wanted. We took some time to understand it, uh, and and thus. It didn't really work out. Uh, on the other hand, um, with, with Altec, uh, as I was just mentioning, we had a perfect alignment. Uh, they, they had been selling uh, the cheapest solar devices uh, when, when we met them. Uh, and really, this was their, this was their edge. Uh, there, were, there were relatively small local company that knew the, the market extremely well. Uh, compared to a uh, very large inter international di distributor. So our vision of actually getting to the bottom, to, to selling to the bottom of the pyramid uh, was perfectly aligned. And this is why it worked so well. Next slide. Um, in terms of uh, the, the second dimension that uh, we discussed was timing. Um, and so it's all about being fast and nimble but at the same time, able to stay the course to make a difference. Uh, here, what we saw was that what was really important was to test rather than uh, get bogged down into uh, drawn out analysis. I mean, analysis is important, but at the end of the day, um, you want to pilot things in the market to see whether consumers are biting or not. Uh, so it's about testing short interventions, focused, uh, and then fo focused on, on a particular issue, a particular point, uh, and then iterate and build. Uh, so not stop at, at one, uh, one pilot, but actually build on this pilot and, and, develop, uh, and develop your intervention. Uh, Sometimes the market is not ready. Sometimes uh, private sector is slow, priorities are, are shifting. So you also need to have this longer term vision uh, of, the thing, of the things you want to do. Uh, I think this, this was very clear in the work around uh, branchless banking and interoperability, where uh, during six years, we had uh, a bunch of different interventions working with MNOs on uh, communication and education of the consumers, working with banks to develop new products, working with aggregators to, uh, to, to develop uh, completely uh, the services that, that, that were completely unexistent uh, and unknown in the, in the country, and even with the, with the central bank. So lots of, of different interventions, um, which some of them failed, some of them were uh, some of them worked uh, very well, but at the end of the day, what what, what has been important uh, was not uh, any of the single intervention, but uh, that the sum of this intervention and the time we spent in that market allowed us to change the way actors related with each other, uh, and so bring the country. Uh, closer to full to, to full interoperability. Um, next next slide, please. Uh, the third dimension uh, is is monitoring, uh, and there 
for us, what's really key is to fo is to focus on execution. Um, we we we, we uh, as MSD programs, we always want to know uh, the, the final impact of our uh, of our projects, of our interventions. But before we do that, we need to be thinking about how things are working with and within our partners. Uh, and to do that, we need to focus on, on, on KPIs, on actual uh, business indicators. We want to know uh, the cost of sales, the margins, uh, the, the cash flow issues. All of these are, are, are critical to actually make things work. And this is when we do monitoring, this is what we what we want to know. I mean, Altec was also was a very good uh, partner for this because Altec was extremely open. Uh, we were very, we had a close, very close relationship with them, and so we always knew very exactly what was going on, what was working, what was not, and and that allowed us to tailor uh, and to target our, our, our support. Uh, going from things that were uh, uh, very simple to uh, uh, things that were much more uh, sophisticated. Next slide. So the, the, the last themes uh, is around uh, finance. Um, and so in terms of finance, it's all about thinking as an investor. Uh, the, the, we need... Uh, we are programs, uh, but uh, MSD programs need to provide what it takes uh, for the partner to succeed. And so sometimes it means uh, not staying away from substantial investments, uh, even in some cases where partner, uh, partner contributions are weaker than we would like. Um, and of course, we need to, uh, the, the, the financing needs to be adapted to the company. Uh, the market uh, opportunity and the part uh, and the partnership stage. So, uh, de depending de depending on these different factors, it, it can be uh, more or less substantial. Uh, but it's um, for, for for a company like Altec, for example, um, it was very clear that we started very small. With I think the, the, the first uh, uh, the first partnership was around five thousand US dollar. It was a small. Um, uh, a small um, promotion mar marketing um, intervention, um, but then two years later, as uh, as Hope mentioned, we we help them set up uh, full pay as you go, the first uh, pay as you go system in the country. Uh, so credit to, credit to consumer through uh, through automated devices, um, and this was a this was a two hundred dollar. Uh, partnership. Um, same thing with uh, same same thing with the um, with interoperability, where uh, we we had uh, some inexpensive uh, some inexpensive interventions, um, more about around congregating the different actors, but we also didn't share a way to, to really uh, finance generously some actors. I think, for example, of the of the aggregators, which needed to develop a whole new technology in an imp uh, in an unproven market, and so uh, in order to make that work, we needed to uh, put enough financing into this. So, final slide. Um, we, at the end of the day, I think the the, the main lesson we we want to convey is. The, the, the reason why Elan uh, was a success was because it acted as a business. Uh, we developed a, a, differ, a diversified portfolio. We knew that some of our intervention would work, some of it uh, would fail. Uh, and I mean, this, this, is, this is what happens in the, in, in the market. You can't really uh, know in advance what's going to work or, or, or what's not. But it's about uh, it's about acting quick, uh, doing different things, and making the right decision as quick as possible. So adapting uh, when it's needed. So with that, I will um, 
I will leave the floor now to our, our panel. Uh, and, but first to, uh, to Mike, who will introduce them. Mike, over to you. Thank you, uh, Gregoire. Um, thank you, or well, thank you all of you actually, great presentations. Yes, if, if we, uh, Ralph, if you can just advance the slide a second. Um, we have, uh, we've, we've, we're trying to create a little bit of space here for a couple of, for three people who had quite important stakeholders in Alain, um, just to give a comment or a remark in relation to what we've just heard. So could I start with uh, Amy, who's the Deputy Director for the Economic Growth Office in Kinshasa. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me decently? Very well. Wonderful. So yeah, great presentation and definitely um, I, I, it's exciting to be here and, and just to um, witness and, and, and celebrate the, the impact of Elan. Um, for us with USAID, it really demonstrated what it looks like to shift merely from thinking about value chains uh, to thinking about market systems. And within DRC, that's a critical approach. Uh, it's a country with tremendous uh, unrealized economic potential. And the incentives that are kind of present for operators, different market actors, aren't optimal for channeling those financial and human resources kind of in, 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 in always the best directions. And so it's been really fascinating to learn from the Elon program. Um, to me, as I onboarded in my assignment with USAID DRC, uh, I appreciated the treasure trove of resources uh, that were available online and then also with, with the team. Um, and then we, we definitely have, um, we don't have a, a broad market um, systems program that is at a, at a national level, but we do really owe you know, a great deal of gratitude to UKA, to, to Elan for, for kind of helping, helping us establish the investment facilitation platform that we recently launched. Uh, which is really building on the success of Elan's access to finance work. Um, and we continue to, to look forward to building on uh, that work uh, um, and really shifting, thinking about how we're shifting, um, uh, contributing towards shifting incentives towards market-led approaches, which is, is really the, the, the critical piece. Um, and I wanted to also just add one additional question um, given Elan's notable work in Eastern Congo, where, where donors continue to invest significantly in emergency and long-term humanitarian programming, um, I, I wanted to, to understand more what your suggestions are around models and practices uh, that are the most promising in terms of shifting conversations and actors towards market-sustained approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I mean, that's uh, really key question and a couple have come in already on the same lines earlier so let's let's come back to that but just before we do um laura uh, if you got you're the um the economic advisor for fcdo now in kinshasa so do you have anything you'd like to add yeah thank you very much mike um so um, a few things. Um, I mean, I've been working uh, in DRC for a couple of years and, and very closely involved with the program in the last year of its implementation. Um, I wanted to share just a couple of reflections from the point of view of the donor for those on the call that are, are donors trying to set up MSD programs, um, particularly around the, the points that Gregoire made around flexible approach and the role of analysis and monitoring. Um, I mean, firstly, on the flexible approach, it's quite amazing looking back 2014 at the start of the programme, where the team actually deliberately designed the programme to be responsive and iterative, and with scope to fail and learn and move on, and that was pretty innovative for the team at the time, and I think, as Gregoire has mentioned, this has been a, a, a real strength um, throughout, and particularly ensuring that the team has remained comfortable to change course and cut their losses when needed uh, and avoided help throwing good money after bad. I think as a donor, what did we grapple with? Uh, as Gregoire mentioned, it was a large portfolio. I mean, over the course of its lifetime, over 200 interventions. And for a donor trying to have oversight of all of that is hard, um, not least given the size of the country and the difficulty visiting parts of it. Uh, and I think it can be challenging for donors who like to ensure um, credit and visibility for their financing at all times. And ultimately, uh, over the course of the programme, we ended up focusing down a little bit in terms, of, in terms of regions and sectors. And I think this helped to make things more manageable. 
Uh, there were some pros and cons perhaps to the decision and a question mark so in my mind as to whether we sort of missed out on building on some initial partnership opportunities elsewhere as a result, but it definitely helped focus expertise. And then communication between us and, and the team was, I mean, it's a no brainer, but it, it was a really important uh, part of uh, building trust and being able to justify choices uh, as they were made. Just on the on the people side as well, um, it was a point that Gregoire had in his presentation, but I don't think it came across enough. Um, um, the value of having a strong and predominantly local team with excellent networks and being able to make connections quickly, uh, I think is essential for uh, what is otherwise an often very opaque context to navigate in DRC. It also, um, because of this, uh, I think Elan was probably one of the best programs in our portfolio um, positioned to respond to COVID when it hit uh, to continue working, but also to design new interventions to respond to the fallout of COVID. Uh, so that was a real plus. And then finally on analysis and monitoring, um, uh, I mean, this is really about getting the right balance uh between making sure making make, being sure about the decisions we're making but also wanting to act as a business and taking some risks and being nimble i think from a donor it's ultimately needing to be able to stand up to scrutiny and defend spending decisions and then specifically for drc recognizing that it's a highly politicized context and there is higher risk of, of doing harm and i think a lot of this feeds into the type of analysis uh, that needs to be done and quite often took us beyond the sort of common MSC questions around market distortions and the usual analysis you would do. Um, just in, in response to that, I think the programme had two additional elements that haven't been mentioned, but I thought would be worth just flagging. One was around decision support unit, which is an extra dimension of the programme we had um, to provide external scrutiny of the approach. Uh, I think that helps to ensure a closer look at some of the interventions where we weren't able to and reflect on their overall alignment to objectives. Um, the other part was on the role of political economy analysis in understanding sector developments and some of the risks around certain partnerships. Um, Elan produced a lot of these regularly in-house. and I think they were useful for highlighting potential risks in sectors and incentives of players and <laughs> quite assuring for us, the donor. Uh, but of course, there are limits to how far you can go on applying this on a partner by partner basis uh, with a limited set of resources. Uh, and of course, drawing on a team with deep knowledge of sectors does that help uh, go a long way to mitigating some of these risks. Um, Mike, I did have a question for the team, but given the time, I think I'll hand back over to you. And I see there's quite a few questions already in the in the box to answer. So thanks very much. You're welcome, Laura, and thank you for, for your contribution and those points. Um, yeah, I do want to get onto the questions that have been posted and the one that uh, Amy raised as well. Um, but just so very quickly, Alex, um, you, you have an, over, an overview of this project, obviously, from your position as the project director uh, for ASI in Africa. Do you have any quick final thought? OK, so, so very quickly, um, obviously, we're very proud to be running the programme for, for seven years. It's, you know, it's, been, it's been quite a kind of... A, flagship in our economic development portfolio. Uh, this approach that Gregoire described of running the running a program more like a business is, you know, certainly a, like a move that we've made uh, in, in a number of MSD programs uh, that, we, that we run. Uh, and then just sort of going on from what Laura was saying about the flexible programming, you know, we believe very strongly and it came across in this presentation that it, you know, it, it is the right way to run market systems development programs. Um, but it does it requires uh, you know, buy-in from buy-in and engagement from from the client uh, in order to allow that flexibility to to take place and also to provide you know the sort of necessary level of, of challenge. And I'm really grateful to the SCDO for you know for for running this you know running and funding this very ambitious program, um, and also to Laura for for. Um, being engaged uh, enough to, to, you know, being very engaged to, you know, allow the flexible programming to take place and also provide us with, you know, with all the challenge that, uh, that she did um, over the course of the program. Uh, if there's, if there's time, I, I, I wanted to ask that the, the team, you know, if there's time for this question about, um, 
we spoke in this particular presentation about uh, two case studies and, and very partner specific interventions, but also interested to know, you know, what, what the program did uh, on a sector level. So beyond the specific partner, you know, uh, so, you know, to do, with, to do with specific sectors in order to move things forward. Thank you, Alex. Um, I've, no, I've made a note of that question, but I'd like to go back to Amy's question um, because it, it, it uh, ties up with a couple of questions that we received before the webinar as well. So there's a general question really about how you do this kind of work in a very fragile and conflict affected setting and, um, and how that links. I mean, the point Amy was making, how does it relate to the humanitarian uh, activities that are going on? Um, in Eastern in Eastern DRCs uh, particularly. So, um, Gregoire, I don't know if you can try and address that general question before we now we narrow in on the more specific ones. Sure. Um, well, you know, I, I think uh, what uh, what Elon showed was that it's uh, completely possible to work in uh, in conflict affected areas. So maybe not, uh, you know, full-fledged ongoing conflict, uh, but the Kivus where you have, uh, you know, uh, sporadic conflict uh, in, in different areas of the uh, of the region uh, actually proved to be a really fertile ground for uh, for for our project and for MSD in general. Um, what is I think you know one of the lessons. Uh, of Elan uh, for MSD programs in fragile context in general, um, is that when, even in a country where the governance is extremely poor and uh, security situation not necessarily very good, the private sector is still active uh, and is responding extremely well to any kind of um, uh, any kind of stimulation. So, I mean, to give, to give you examples, in the Kivus, uh, which are the, the, the most conflicted area of, uh, of the RC, we probably had our, our best example, our, our best success in terms of uh, uh, developing a company that would distribute seeds. Um, and when I say distribute, I mean actually sell, right? Uh, so not provide end out um, in in a as, as is usually done, uh, and this in a in an area where a lot of NGOs are still providing seeds for free. So even in these areas, you have also a segment, a consumer segment that's ready to buy uh, quality seeds, um, and I would say. The very same things goes for uh, for renewable energy, where uh, Altec is actually was actually based in the Kivu, and most of its market uh, for a very long time has been the uh, has been the Kivu. We actually help them uh, go out uh, of Kivu, including to uh, uh, Kinshasa and, and Kasai. Uh, but uh, so the, the the answer is yes. Uh, MSD programs can can work in, and make an impact in, in these environments. Uh, of course, the uh, the methodology needs to be uh, adapted, uh, and part of our part uh, of our work was to uh, do the right uh, due diligence, including a political analysis for the, the partners we and sectors we we were working with. Um, but uh, and we had also very stringent uh, uh, security uh, uh, security security uh, measure, measures for the for the staff. But uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, it worked quite well. Okay, great. Thank thank you. That's a very comprehensive answer. So that we've got uh, there are three quite specific questions in the Q and I'm going to see if we can try and address those. Um, if you've got any more questions, please throw them in. And if necessary, look, I'll let the webinar overrun by a few minutes. Um, so if you have to drop off, thank you for coming. But we will we'll run five or five or ten minutes longer if necessary, to, so we cover everything. So look, in the in the questions that I can see in the chat box right now, there's one I'd like to start with actually 
from Lenemp Hansen um, because it's a question about something that didn't work so well. And it, so it's in a quite, it's in a way it's addressed to you, Edwige. Um, so Lenemp is asking if you could just explain why the digital product with Finca failed. Um, in, in, perhaps explore, explore, you know, what can go wrong? It's a very good question. Um, what I can say is that um, I think uh, the time spent on analyzing the market and then adjusting the features of the product uh, could have been, you know, we could, we could have taken longer together with the partners for that. Uh, because they were in a hurry to test the market with this, and we we, we all understood that. Um, maybe there was a bit of pressure um, because in the end, we, this is the private sector, and you know, you, you if there is a market for something and you see a business case, then you do take into account that there might be a bit of try and error in the beginning, but we will launch something. But I can give an example that, for example, in the technical features. Um, for some reason, it was only possible to start the product, the, the, the savings and loans product in, um, in a US dollar. You know, I think most of you know that in the, in the DRC, two currencies are being used, the local currency and US dollar. Whereas they realized later on that the majority of the M-Pesa base was actually local currency. And therefore, um, the product that was launched launched was not um, addressing the needs of the, the, the bigger portion of the clientele. Now, it doesn't mean that, uh, that that was the reason for the failure, but that 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 this is one element because the product was launched onto the market. A few people tried, it didn't work. And then later on, uh, when you come with a second iteration of the product that is maybe uh, broader and more adapted, maybe people have lost interest. So this is one example. The second um, element was that uh, we are talking about two actors that are both uh, leaders in their own segment, uh, but very clearly one being massively bigger than the other one me meant that in terms of decision making and, and pushing uh, the, the product, maybe the, the balance in terms of uh, strength was not, um, was not um, balanced. Um, and this is a personal opinion, but I do think that that played a role uh, in the sense that um, maybe the microfinance institution had something in mind in terms of having already identified the need within its own portfolio of those very tiny um, micro entrepreneurs that could be that could use this uh, product. Uh, but on the other side, those uh, not yet, not, maybe not uh, uh, being analyzed the same way by the bigger actor. So uh, th those are the two elements I would put on the table. Um, and then the third one, and I'll end with that, is on our end, I mentioned result monitoring. Um, we had a bit of a gap between the moment where the product was launched, where we, we were partners in the launch, and then the, the moment where we did the first um, detail review, market review. And I think we lost a bit of time there and failed to, uh, uh, to have early warnings, um, uh, early signals of things that could have been adjusted already from the first few months. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Edwige. I'm, I just had a message from Laura that the Q&A box isn't working very well. I'm sorry about that. We'll have mm -hmm. to find out why that was. But um, Laura asked this question, I'll, and I'll read it out. Um, we have been grappling a bit with the difficult challenge of measuring and attributing market system changes to the programme. But I've also noted that this is key to trying to determine the overall value for money of the program. So this is a, a topic that's close to my heart, the value for money of programs and the difficulty of, of measuring and attributing that. Can you say a few words on how the team sought to address this measurement challenge? Wow, that's a big question, but I don't know if, um, Ralph, you might have an answer to that from your work with Altec. Have we still got Ralph? Or have we lost him? Yes, sorry, here again. Oh, good. Sorry, I'm just still there. Did you did you see <laughs> did you see that question from from Laura? No, I did not. Could you just repeat that last bit that you said, uh, Mike? Sorry. Yeah. So it was. So it's in the chat box if you want to um, have a look. But essentially, she's saying, uh, how did you address this measurement challenge around the question of attributing of measuring and attributing market system changes 
to the program? I mean, you know, here you are, you've supported Altec, you've got all these results, but how do you decide what you can attribute to Elan's work? I mean, this is this is obviously a question that I think within uh, the whole of Elan we've been uh, constantly asking ourselves. And I think if if we if I sort of speak from from my own sector, um, I think it's also a question of um, yes, value for money, but also what is the work that we've carried out. Uh, if we look at uh, Altec, you know, yes, uh, we've supported them financially. And uh, with that support, a project came out, and as a result of that project, uh, certain things came into a results framework. But I, I feel that if we if we only look at that top line, um, we're actually missing the points of a lot of other things that we've done uh, with them. We've developed business model. We've linked them to four different international partners. They now have a gamut of options uh, from three manufacturers uh, in China. Uh, they've moved on to cook stoves. Um, they've employed hundreds of people. Um, and so I think if we start really looking at, at, at those kind of considerations and, and especially value for money, um, it is a, a slippery slope because if we open up the whole door, we will see that there's so, so much that we've actually done there and how to specifically attribute those sections. Yeah, I think again, there's, there's some that can easily be attributed, uh, but I'd also like to throw that back at donors at times and say, what are you guys looking at? And I understand that politically, you know, you put money into a program, you want something to come out. But um, at, at times, it's, it's also the softer, uh, smaller things that exist outside the framework that I think um, have led also to the success uh, in part along, is that we were able to do things outside of this framework knowing that at one point it will lead to it. I think Gregoire also mentioned this. And then we were really specifically looking at business KPIs first, because only through a successful business can we get in the end to a successful outcome of a program. And I think that's really what drives MSD programs uh, to become successful. I hope that made sense. It made a great deal of sense to me, yeah. um, Ralph. Uh, having just completed the uh, 2021 evidence review of... Uh, which looked at, I think, at 35 different programs, and these questions keep coming up. And the answer you gave, I thought, was very articulate, actually. I don't know whether uh, any of our panelists would like to respond to that, Amy or Laura. It'd be interesting to hear what you think. I mean, I don't, you don't feel- Hi, Mike. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is Laura. I mean, uh, yeah, very conscious of time and we could talk about this for hours. Um, uh, it's definitely something we've talked to our, uh, Ilan uh, for hours about. Um, uh, and I, I think you're right. I think Ralph did uh, respond to the question very articulately. I think for the, I think it's important though to go beyond, I, I agree with the points around sort of a successful business being your one of your first measures. Um, and of course, during the program, we've had our some results monitoring and looked at um, uh, net attributable income change amongst beneficiaries, and we've we, you know we've collected those sorts of results. Um, but as we neared the end of the program, uh, you know, we were very conscious that to really try and judge the the value for money of the overall <laughs> uh, program, we really need to look a bit further and understand what changes we've seen in the different sectors and markets that Ilan have worked in and, and how do you get how do you bring all of that information together we've had some really great experts working on these sectors who know them inside out and you know sometimes it's a challenge to sort of draw all of that information out of them um, it's there but it's not always articulated and written on paper we did we did make some efforts towards the end of the program to to run uh, a set of surveys with different market actors to try and gauge a little bit more where changes have happened. Not so easy to attribute to the program itself, but you know we can make those links where the program has been very actively involved. Um, uh, and I think it's something we'll continue to look at for the next year at least, uh, as we sort of think about uh, subsequent evaluation uh, towards the end of uh, uh, the overall program. Uh, I hope that <laughs> responds a little bit to a very big question. Uh, I thought it was very a very um... 
a, a very clear and succinct response given the, the, the constraints of the time we're under and that, that, that this conversation could run, if you like, for hours. Um, and it is fascinating. So look, we have overrun already by six minutes. Um, I wanna just say, if you need to leave, um, please go, but do fill in our quick survey form before you do. There's a link in the chat box right now. Um, just let us know what you thought about the webinar. Um, so I, I'm, I don't know what to say now. There's a question from Garrett Mina, Menning, which really is for you, Ralph, but it might be better off if you answered it in writing, I think, to Garrett rather than trying to uh, explain it here and now. And we'd be happy to connect you later if, that's, if that would help. Um, and there's a question from Beatrice. Maybe we should just finish with that one. It's about how, how you work with companies and incentivize them to share their share what information that is inevitably often quite sensitive with you as a program. And you must have encountered that in all of your, on many of your interventions. Yeah, so either, and I think I can, if, if you wouldn't mind, Mike, I can quickly uh, answer yeah. both in, in one go. I think quickly to Garrett, all of our um, support was in grants. So we didn't do any uh, you know, cost sharing or, or loans or VC or any investing. We thought as an investor, but we actually never expected that money back. But we did see, of course, what kind of return we would get. And then return for us, of course, is the results um, to the program. Um, and then back to the, um, how did we incentivize companies to share sensitive information? I mean, the answer that I'd like to give here is that we really put it forward uh, through trust, A, and, and B, um, Again, from, from my experience, we never put it forward as a requirement or we never put it forward as a way to control or, or check companies and see what they were doing. We actually put it forward as a way that we can support them in improving maybe some business models or having other people look at it or providing them with an extra set of eyes um, where you know people like myself and my colleagues in the Renewable Energy team have had experience uh, with renewable energy companies um, across the region and, and, and for example, in, in some more developed uh, sectors uh, or markets such as Kenya, um, so that we could actually advise them on that. So we really looked at you know, how, yeah, it, 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 for us, we really wanted companies to want us to look at their sensitive information rather than us imposing that on them for some kind of due diligence or uh, you know, wanting to find out what it is that they're doing. It was really the other way around. Do you want us to have a look at it? Is there a way that we can support you in it so we can do some good business modeling and maybe uh, share some insights that we've had from, from other markets or other companies? If you allow maybe a quick word um, adding to that. Uh, I think for both Raoul and myself, it was very, and, and also other colleagues, it was very useful um, that our own network were made of, of, of those people before we actually started working with Elan. And therefore reaching out to those, we were reaching out to people that we knew already and we had you know, the credit of having some trust built already. And that was pretty helpful. If not crucial. <laughs> Well, thank you for those two last two last answers. I think that's really interesting because, in a way, that encapsulates for me what is different about market systems development as an approach to what has gone before in so many development approaches. Um, it encapsulates the difference in where the power lies in the relationship between the donor-funded project and the partner. And um, in a way, I, I, I think I'm going to hold on to that as a, a brilliant last thought. In a way, um, as a message to take forward. Can I just say thank you so much, Gregoire, um, Edwige uh, and Ralph for, for your really interesting presentations. I'm really glad that we, we let things run over and answered those questions. It was, uh, it's been fascinating and uh, I think it's been a really something that we can really learn from. And thank you also to, to Alex, Laura and Amy for your uh, interesting observations and, and in your case, especially Laura for the interesting question that you threw up uh, about attribution. that's it for this webinar um do please click on that quick feedback link and let us know what you thought um really appreciated the presentations really appreciated your participation